Good, <clears throat> good evening. Thank you for having me here. Yes, I'm a big bad ex-fed. <clears throat> My first exposure to the law would be 80 years ago. <clears throat> Next week is the 70th anniversary of the landing in D-Day. Ten years after that date, I was living in Italy with my father. My father was a linguist, and he was working for the Department of State under the 1948 Displaced Persons Act because during <clears throat> the decades between the First World War and the Second World War, of course, 100 million people had lost their lives. Millions of people were in economic distress and homeless. And my father was doing background investigations to determine who were ex-Nazis, who were ex-fascists, who could come to the United States. And my father would lecture me at a very young age, thanks, about the issues of a depression, the issues of international politics, i.e remembered a question he asked me, what do you know about the Jade Treaty of 1758? I didn't know the answer. <clears throat> and then he went on to talk about the 49th parallel uh, that divided the United States and Canada. And I digress, but in 1973, I found myself at the U.S. Border Patrol Academy in Los Fresnos, Texas, walking down a sidewalk, and the commandant of the academy stopped me and said, where are you from, boy? And I said, well, that's an interesting question. Where was I born? Where was I conceived? Uh, and he said, uh, answer the question. And I said, all right. I just graduated from the University of Vermont, and uh, I'm here <clears throat> with a badge and a gun and a burning desire in my heart to see justice served. <laughs> he says, you may not make it. <clears throat> And then he said, what do you have on your shoes? And I looked down and I said, you mean the tassels? And he said, yeah, cut them off. <clears throat> we wear boots down here in South Texas. So that started my 35 year career with the then INS, Immigration and Naturalization Service. I was stationed in Florida during the Mario boat lift. I was stationed in Chicago for 10 years, uh, working for the SINs, C-I-N-S, the government loves acronyms, which stood for criminal, immoral, narcotic, and subversive. I found myself uh, in the early 70s ch chasing ex-Nazis, uh, presenting evidence seized at Auschwitz and Dachau in removal proceedings so these folks could stand trial back in Germany. And then I proceeded to be an anti-smuggling agent for the next 11 years. Now, I don't look like a smuggler, so my undercover role was, <clears throat> much like my father, who was a naval aviator, I was also a pilot. But my airplane had been seized by DEA, running drugs. I needed $50,000 uh, to pay the lawyers, and I was willing to smuggle drugs, aliens, you name it. And that's what I did for a number of years. <clears throat> I'd pick up loads in Nogales, Arizona, take them to Chicago nonstop. I could do it in 27 hours, work the cases, get the search warrants, <clears throat> so on and so forth, and make the criminal cases. Interesting enough, uh, the largest and the longest case that I worked on had 41 defendants, only one of whom was a Mexican national. Most of them were Eastern Europeans. It was quite interesting to stop at a, a, at a safe house somewhere along the route, and in the morning you'd find several individuals with prayer rugs facing east. And this was in the 1980s. 1979, the uh, student uh, overtaking of our, our U.S. Embassy and, and Tehran and all the associated issues with that. So I wanted to work criminal cases, and that's what I did, including the arrest of Zakarias Masawi for the events of, of 2001. I did not personally arrest him, but I supervised the unit that did. And Zakarias is now um, in a supermax prison, life without parole in Colorado. And, and if you recall, he was actually up for the death penalty, but the jury that heard that aspect of the case decided life imprisonment was, was more appropriate. 
since I hit the mandatory retirement age of 57, I started to practice some law. I'm a graduate of William Mitchell. Unfortunately for me, my first client that came in through the door had an issue with the government. And he said, by the way, I have my uh, office administrator here. And I saw red flags right away. And I, and I advised him. I said, well, I don't even know what the issues are here. And do I represent the corporation? Do I represent you as an individual? What nefarious activity, if any, is your administrator involved in? He said, oh, no, those are no issues. <clears throat> I, I want her to sit in on this. OK. <clears throat> I had a short legal career <clears throat> because the woman came in, and her eyes were dotting around like she was on math, which I had seen a lot of in my career. And after a couple minutes, I looked at her and said, hello, Mercedes. And this is a woman I had arrested in 1995 and had <laughs> convicted uh, for various felony offenses. And interesting enough, last week in the Star Tribune, I read the name Mercedes Maldonado out of Rochester, Minnesota, who was indicted for <clears throat> fraud against the government to the tune of $2.1 million because what she would do is sell false identity just to folks. And then these uneducated folks would have her file their tax returns. Of course, she got the returns, falsified their names under different identities, and uh, defrauded the government and these folks of that amount of money. So some things never change. I decided I needed to do something else. So I became an advocate for folks that had been brought into the United States at an early age. Now they're in the DACA program, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. And how that happened is I was mentoring high school students. And I had one student over one night, and we were eating pizza, and he started to cry. And I said, what's the matter? He said, uh, my mouth hurts. Well, when was the last time you were to a dentist? He said, I've never been taken to a dentist. And what he had was four impacted wisdom teeth. So I inquired as to all the circumstances, and then he said, you're not going to like me. I said, why would that be? He said, well, I was brought to the United States at the age of four, and my parents just told me, and I have no future. And that was four years ago. He is now a college student on the dean's list every year, and he's been accepted into a research program um, that potentially will allow him to go to Harvard. So there's so much potential out there. And from an agent that worked in the field for many years, intercepting smuggling cases by the hundreds, learning how to build bridges with people, because that's what you had to do. If you stopped a smuggling case and you open the back of a U-Haul van, there's 80 folks in there. There's 80 folks that have 80 different lives. And you had to learn how to effectively communicate with those people because they're going to be the witnesses in your case. It's a lot harder than to stop a car with a kilo of cocaine in the trunk because the cocaine isn't going to talk. 80 people are going to have 80 different stories. So the lesson that I got from my father years ago in the 1950s when we lived in Italy, he said, be true to yourself, make a contribution, never genuflect to the dollar bill, and be honest. And I thank him for those life lessons. <laughs>